Happy Friday. So everybody who brought their mom gets extra credit today. Let's see, how many moms do I have here today? Mom back here? Where is mom over here? Okay. Mom's, mom's here, and you're, you're an adopted mom by about everybody in the area now, okay? Any other moms here today? I thought we could give the, oh, oh there we go, okay, extra credit back there, all right. I thought we'd give the moms a pop quiz today. What do you guys think about that? Yeah. See how much moms know? <laughs> so I'll give you the pop quiz and then I'll make sure they give you the answers and then that way you'll know how much they know, right? You, you think we should sing a song for mom, do you? Okay, maybe we should. <clears throat> So I have a special song that I wrote for moms, and the rule here is these guys have to sing loud, and moms especially have to sing very loud, okay? So the song, you know the, you know the tune Danny Boy? Oh, Danny Boy. All right. This is, this is a song for mom. It's called Oh, Mommy Dear. All right? You guys ready? La, 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 la. All right, a song for mom. <laughs> oh, mommy dear, this is my biochemistry. The problem's long, the course is really tough. That last exam, it really put the fear in me. I studied hearts, I hope it was enough. But let's forget about it while you're visiting. And have some fun when we get out of class. Then when you're gone, I'll go back to my studying. That Kevin A. Hearn really, truly is an awesome. Everybody gets extra credit. This is good. So, okay. I want to make sure we got the right, the right end of that lyric there. So, okay. So, I hope you guys are having a good time. And now we get to have less fun. Okay, so... Oh, and no, I don't have any other songs for the day, so we're, we're stuck with it. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay, so a um, couple of let's see, a couple of announcements. Uh, one is I have uh, settled on a review session, and that was going to be Monday at five in this room. Okay. So that'll be here at 5 o'clock on Monday in this room. I will videotape it and make those uh, things available, so they should be available sometime on Tuesday if you can't stay for the review session. So the review session, Monday, 5 o'clock, right here. Okay? And that was the only time I could do it. I tried to do it on Tuesday. I tried to do it on Sunday. And it turns out my schedule is kind of wicked, so I apologize for that. But I will have that videotape for you. Okay? I've also decided that I'll stop the material for the exam at the end of transcription. Okay? So transcription, which is what I'm going to finish up today, uh, will be the last of the material for the second exam. It's not comprehensive, so it's only since the last material that will, will be on this exam. Make sense? I've had several questions about, am I going to give you practice exams? And the answer is no. Okay? And as I said to a couple of students, I don't do that to be mean, but um, I give practice exams so that you know the format of the exams that I give, and the format is not going to change. Now. If I honestly felt that giving you a practice exam would help you, I would, but I think practice exams actually hurt students in my experience. And the reason that they hurt is students focus on the practice exams instead of focusing on the material. So I will not give you a practice exam for the second exam for that reason. You know the format of the exam now, and uh, hopefully that will help benefit you. Okay? Um, I haven't done the regrades uh, of the exams. I will get those done this weekend, and I'll return those to the main office. Uh, by Monday. So you can pick them up in the main office where you got your original exam the other day. Okay? We all on the same page? Okay. Well, let's get back and talk now, finish up talking about transcription. Last time I talked uh, about a fairly detailed process called attenuation, um, which I still haven't corrected that spelling there. I guess I've got to make sure I fix that. I haven't done that. Um, 
What I want to talk about today uh, is turn our attention to eukaryotic transcription. So what we've been saying, what I've been saying so far, relates to prokaryotes. All right, prokaryotes uh, transcription is um, considerably simpler than that of eukaryotes, and that doesn't mean we're going to dive into the deep end of the complexity of eukaryotes at this point because uh, we're not. Uh, but we should know some general things about the differences in complexity between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Okay, so uh, eukaryotes. First of all, one difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic transcription is in prokaryotes we saw one RNA polymerase. It made all of the three different kinds of RNA, transfer RNA, messenger RNA, and ribosomal RNA. In um, eukaryotes, we see three RNA polymerases. We see one each for those different types of RNA. Three different polymerases for, uh, eukaryote, for eukaryotes. Okay. So the, the um, RNA polymerase 1 is involved in making mostly ribosomal RNA. RNA polymerase 2 is involved in making mostly messenger RNA. And RNA polymerase 3, you can guess, is mostly involved in making transfer RNA. I say mostly because there are some minor exceptions to those, but for the most part, if you know that, you know the the categories of the enzymes and what they make. Okay, so that's one thing. We're going to focus here mostly on RNA polymerase 2 because it's the one that makes the messenger RNA. And for our purposes, the messenger RNAs are the most important ones because they're the ones that code for the protein. Okay? So, um, your book has a lot of blah, blah, blah that I will show you, but I'm not going to hold you responsible for. So. This figure shows you that RNA polymerase 1 is a multi-subunit protein. There are 12 subunits in RNA polymerase. Okay? And we can see that they have a variety of functions, and that's not the most important thing for our purposes. Okay? Transcription in eukaryotes is much more complicated, partly because we don't, ha we don't have bare DNA like we have in, 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 uh, in eukaryotes. We don't have bare DNA like we have in prokaryotes. Okay? In eukaryotes, we've got chromatin. DNA wrapped with protein. So we might imagine that there's a lot more complexity to opening up that DNA so that RNA polymerase can come along and make the RNA. And in fact, there is a big difference. We're not going to go into the, those differences, but there's a very big difference. It's much more complex. In prokaryotes, RNA polymerase can bind basically to the promoter and start doing its thing. As long as it had that sigma factor on there, you saw that RNA polymerase in E. coli could just bind and do its thing. In eukaryotes, we don't see that. We see it takes a variety of proteins to help the RNA polymerase to get started. Many proteins in some cases. Okay? Some of those are involved in opening up that region. Some of those are helping uh, the RNA polymerase to recognize the right promoter. Some of those are involved in stopping RNA polymerase from working on a promoter. A variety of different functions that we can see uh, in these. We're not going to focus on, again, the complexity, we, I want you to understand the gener general e issues there. If this is a very simple schematic um, of uh, a uh, control region or a promoter for uh, a eukaryotic gene. And I will emphasize that one of the complexities of eukaryotes is that there's not a simple situation like we had in prokaryotes. In prokaryotes, we can say we've got a minus 10 sequence, we've got a minus 35 sequence, and those two, if we understand those, we probably understand 90% of the prokaryotic uh, promoters. In eukaryotes, this looks very simple. Well, there's our Tata box that was a minus 10 in the prokaryotes. It's about minus 25 to about minus 50 in uh, eukaryotes. Okay. But that's all we see. And we think, oh, that's, that's great. Well, what's this upstream element? What's this downstream element business, et cetera? Okay. It turns out that control regions for eukaryotes are amazingly diverse and amazingly scattered. Okay? Minus 10 is plus or minus a couple of, of nucleotides. It's within a couple of nucleotides of being minus 10. This guy can be spread out over easily 30 nucleotides, possibly. It's variable in position. Okay? There are other elements, and when we, when we say an element, one of the things we talk about in eukaryotes is an element. An element is a sequence that's recognized by a protein. So we talk about a sequence element 
It's something that's being recognized by a protein that's binding to it. Now, if we think about the difference between a eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic cell, some of what I'm going to say about elements will hopefully make some sense to you. Okay? If I'm a little bacterium, I've only got to worry about doing one thing, making other little bacteria that are identical to me. Right? All E. coli are going to look alike. They're all going to do the same thing. They don't have differentiation. They don't have specialization. They divide, they divide, they divide, they divide. They don't do anything but that. In me, I started out as a single fertilized egg, as did all of you, unless you're space aliens. Okay? <laughs> all space aliens, please raise your hands, right? Okay? <laughs> There's one space alien. <laughs> I can see that. Okay. So, we start from one egg, from one cell, a fer one fertilized egg. Yet we have bones, we have teeth, we have hair, we have skin. And every single one of those guys has exactly the same DNA. Now, we see we had to have some cells doing some things and other cells doing other things for us to have differentiation. Okay? Bone cells have different needs than do skin cells. Intestinal cells have different needs than do uh, retinal cells. Okay? There's going to be a difference in genes being made in those cells. And we start thinking about all the different thousands of possibilities of needs we realize that having simple differences in the minus 10, minus 35 doesn't address all of those needs very well. So eukaryotic cells have many different elements that are bound by different proteins. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Okay? For example, let's say there, there is a, um, uh, there's a gene called troponin that is made in muscle cells. And you've got different kinds of muscle cells. Okay? So different muscle cells have different versions of troponin, whereas skin cells don't have much of a need for troponin. Okay? Muscle cells will have a protein in them that recognizes a sequence element, binds to it, and starts transcription. The same sequence element is in skin cells, but they don't have the protein that binds to it that starts transcription. So we see that these sequence elements can play a very, very important role in tissue specificity. Tissue specificity. Different tissues have different needs. So now it becomes a much simpler problem. Yes, I may have hundreds or even thousands of these different, these different sequence elements, but I can control very readily which tissues are going to be in by whether or not that tissue makes the protein that binds to it. Okay? Does that make sense? Some grudging nods. Okay, so tissues have different needs for proteins, different genes to be expressed, okay? The simple, a, a relatively simple way for the body to control whether a muscle cell makes a certain gene is if a muscle cell makes a protein that binds to that gene. Yes, sir? Is that a circular argument? Oh, I like this question. Is this a circular argument? Okay, it seems like it's a cop-out argument, but it's not. Because during the process of development, what happens during the development of a muscle cell, one of the things is determining whether that protein is being made. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go back to the earliest stages of development. There are things that we can talk about at that point that gets very complex. But a muscle cell is a muscle cell because during its developmental process, it has, in fact, activated specific proteins that now activate specific genes. Okay? Yes? A muscle cell knows that it's a muscle cell. Absolutely. Okay. And the reason it's a muscle cell, as he said, is almost circular because it makes proteins that make it a muscle cell. Okay. Now, this is a fascinating area uh, of understanding, and it's a very active area of research. Okay. Understanding the the beginnings of that circular argument. Okay. Is one of the most is the hottest areas of molecular biology. You're understanding gene expression in eukaryotic cells, and understanding why is a muscle cell a muscle cell, why is a retinal cell a retinal cell, and it ultimately comes down to these proteins. Once I know these 